You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. We're joined today by Dr. Barbara Ray Venner, one of the first ladies of investigative genetic genealogy. Dr. Venner, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Are you okay with this first ladies of investigative genetic genealogy? Sure, why not? Oh, okay. I like it. (laughs) So can you go ahead and start by telling us a little bit about your background, please? That's always a tough question to answer. I've done a number of different things over the years. I've reinvented myself periodically. So I actually started out as a computer programmer way back when, out of high school. I was one of those notorious COBOL programmers. I was doing that in New Zealand and in Australia. And then I met my first husband in Australia and moved to the U.S., I actually couldn't get a job as a programmer, even though I was living in Palo Alto, which ultimately became the foundation of Silicon Valley. This is back before Title IX. So basically, people would tell me, gee, we really can't have a woman coming in at night. And I'd say, in Sydney, they would just send a cab for me if I needed to come in. And then when I was through, then they'd send me home in a cab. Oh, no, we can't do that. So I ended up going back to school, went to the College of San Mateo. From there, transferred to the University of California at San Diego, where I did a double major in biochemistry and psychology. And then from there, I was doing, I then went to graduate school also at UC San Diego and have a PhD in biology. And from there, I was a postdoctoral fellow at Roswell Park in Buffalo, New York. That was a shock moving from San Diego to Buffalo. I was going to say, Uh, (laughs) (laughs) as we have this talk in the middle of the winter. (laughs) There was a lot of snow in Buffalo. And from there, I took a position as an assistant professor, actually in the surgery department at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. And somewhere along the line, I decided that I was really interested in medical bioethics. Since I was a Texas resident, I applied to the University of Texas Law School in Austin, and I was accepted. My plan was to go into medical ethics. But then when I was applying for jobs, people would look at my resume and they'd say, you've got all the science background, you should be a patent attorney. Not something I'd ever thought about. So there were some intellectual property classes at UT. I took those and I decided, "Mm, this is interesting. I then applied for positions, and when I graduated from law school was in 1985, the very, very beginning of the biotech boom. So here I was, graduating with a law degree, I have a PhD in biology, and at the time, the people who were trying to write biotech patent applications were all chemists. There's a big difference between how chemists think and how biologists think. A chemist is interested in spiffy new molecules and structure. A biologist is interested in what is the function? What does that Mm -hmm. molecule do? And I applied for various jobs. I got every single job I applied for. I worked for a firm in Dallas initially, and then a position came open with a guy called Bert Rowland. And Bert was famous for having done the first biotech patent application. Now, his PhD was in chemistry, but this was the Cohen-Boyer patent. It was a joint patent between Stanford and the University of California. So this position came open with him, and I was so excited. I thought, wow, if I could only work with Bert, that'd be wonderful. I applied for a job with him, and he took me on. He was just a fabulous mentor. I just learned so much from him. So that was where I was, and I eventually actually started my own firm, and that was in 2000. I did that for five years, and then I retired in 2005. Then I started working on my family history research. Things took another turn. I was supposed to be retired, playing some tennis, doing some traveling. I kept getting people who were matching with me who were adopted, and I had no idea how to help them. So I went online, and I found a class that was offered by a group called DNAadoption.org. It was a six-week class. 
So I took that. And of course, they then, while I was taking it, they learned I had a science background. And so they asked if I would help with teaching the class and if I was interested in becoming a search angel. So I did that. And because of my background, they also asked me to answer questions that came in through their webmail. And this was where my life took another kind of a branch here. There was an email came in from a deputy, Peter Headley, out of the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department, Crimes Against Children Detail. He wanted to know if the technique that we were teaching to adoptees to find their birth relatives, could that be used to identify somebody who didn't know who she is or where she was from? It was a, a woman called, she was known by the name Lisa Jensen. Lisa had been abducted as a six-month-old infant, so she had no clue where you know anything about herself. So I said, sure, and I volunteered to work on that. That was the beginning of what I'm now doing. You wow. used an expression, by the way, that we should probably explain. You refer to yourself as a search angel. For people that are not familiar, can you explain what a search angel is? Sure. The usual definition is somebody who helps people who are adoptees or people who somewhere in their family tree, there's like maybe an adoptive grandparent. We help them find out who those people are. It's If you're a true search angel, it's done free. We don't charge for our services. That has got to put you in some contact with really fascinating people. This question from Peter Headley down in San Diego, okay. Barbara, was that the first time someone from law enforcement was asking you if you could turn ancestry searches on their head a little bit to help someone like Lisa Jensen? I believe it is actually the first time that did happen because I think some of the other cases that were done looking at trying to identify people like Paul Franczak and Benjamin Kyle, law enforcement was not actually involved and those were actually searches that were initiated by the individual themselves. So I think actually this was probably the first time that this type of technique was being used in a criminal case. You mentioned Paul Franczak. That's how I first heard your name is I had read about Paul's case and about all of the investigative genetic genealogy that he was trying to use to track down his parents. And I remember the very first time that was where I heard your name when I was talking to Bill and he was talking about the GSK case. I was like, I know that name. Where do I know that name from? Oh, it's the Paul Franczak case. Yeah, I actually didn't work on that case. It was worked on, though. I don't know if DNA adoption worked on that one. I know they worked on the Benjamin Kyle case. Paul Franksack, I think, was mainly CC. No, we'll have to ask her about that. We're supposed to be getting together with her as well. Is Paul Holes now one of the first people to ask you, could you use this technology and begin to reverse engineer a search with a law enforcement focus? Yes, and in fact, the reason that Paul Holes asked me was because he knew Peter Headley, because the guy who had abducted Lisa, we eventually identified him as Terry Rasmussen, and he was actually arrested in Contra Costa County for murdering his common-law wife there. Paul, of course, was also in Contra Costa County, so he knew Peter Headley through all of that stuff, and they were on a phone call apparently at some point, and he was boasting that we'd solved who Lisa was. So right after that, Paul then gave me a call to see if I'd be willing to work on one of his cold cases. Fascinating. So had people often refer to this case as the Bear Brook case from New Hampshire, am I correct? Actually, it's the precursor. It was because I was able to identify who Lisa's mother was. I identified her as a woman called Denise Bodan. And I had also, in addition to identifying the mother, I'd also come up with some names for who her father was. And I had five brothers. So one of them was presumably Lisa's father. But then we discovered that, in fact, her grandfather is still alive. And so we asked the grandfather, so who is Lisa's father? And he says, Bob Evans. Bob Evans was not one of the names I'd come up with. On a hunch, Peter Headley sent a picture of the guy who had abducted Lisa to the grandfather. Yes, that's Bob Evans. There were some similarities in the MO between how the people, the Bear Brook murders, how those people were killed and how their bodies were treated that were very similar to how the woman in Contra Costa County was murdered. So she was dismembered. She was wrapped in, her body parts were wrapped in plastic, tied with electrical tape, and then she was buried under 200 pounds of kitty litter in the basement of her home. The Bear Brook folks, the two, the adult female and the eldest child, 
killed by blunt force trauma, which was how Eunsun Jun was killed, and then dismembered, wrapped in plastic, tied with electrical tape. In their case, they were stuffed into steel barrels. So there was enough similarity in the MO. And of course, it turns out that where Denise Baudin was living with this guy was in Allen's New Hampshire, which was like 20 minutes away from Bearbrook Park. And there's the unfortunate 15-year gap between the discovery of the first bodies at Bearbrook State Park and then the second bodies in a nearby location. Yeah, that's correct. The first, the adult female and the eldest child were discovered in 1985, and then the other two little girls were discovered in 2000. I always think it's such a shame that there's so much sadness around that case, but that gap was so unfortunate because as I understand it from photographs and from talking to people that have been there, these barrels were not very far apart. It's just that they had defined a search parameter fairly close to where the original barrel with the two homicide victims had been found and unfortunately didn't go much beyond the perimeter of the search area that they were looking at. Yeah, from pictures, it looks like it was very overgrown, so that yes. also might partly explain it, yeah. So you'd mentioned at the top of the conversation that you'd worked with Paul Holes. Does that mean that you're in his new book? I have no idea. <laughs> if he's talking about DSK, <laughs> I would hope so. I would hope so, too. <laughs> <laughs> I just saw that he has dates coming up for jumping around the country a little bit for speaking engagements. He must because these are a little bit further into the spring. I haven't seen a publication date for the book itself, but he's got dates booked at various cities around the country. So I think it must be coming soon. No, I know what it is because I looked this morning. <laughs> oh, oh, tr trust the teacher. So what's the date, Kristen Dilly? It's April 24th. And then on the 26th, he'll be signing a crime con. And these other dates yes. are all clustered around crime con, which is at the end of April. Yeah, make sure you're on a panel at CrimeCon, so that'll be fun. Yay. Oh, that, that was one of our questions. Yeah. We're both going to be there. We'll be on Podcast Row with Mind Over Murder, and we may be doing some other discussions. It depends on the schedule, which gets pretty full. So what's your panel all about? I'm not quite sure. The person who's arranging it, whose name I'm not going to remember, I'm horrible with names, had actually asked me to do a couple of different kinds of presentations, so I actually don't have the details. Have you done CrimeCon before? I was invited to do it last year and ended up not getting my signed agreement in time. I was actually disappointed because they were doing it in Austin, and I haven't been back to Austin mm -hmm. since I graduated. It would have been nice to have to spend some time there, so I haven't been yet. Is it fun? It is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. It's really great. We have a ton of fun every time that we've gone. What is it, Bill? Is this going to be our fourth year? I think so, yeah. I think uh, fourth for me, but I think fifth for you. Let's see. I think I went to every one except for the first one. I think there's been five. There was one that was scheduled for Orlando, which was canceled due to COVID. And yeah. even last year at Austin, which is one of my favorite places as well, Barbara, and I've spoken down at South by Southwest and been down there because of the music industry connections in my previous life. I love Austin, although boy, has it changed. It's very different. Even in the years that I've been going, it's changed quite a bit. It was a lot of fun. I think Las Vegas is going to be probably the biggest crime con yet. Yeah, it's going to be great. Barbara, I meant to ask you, you were talking about the early part of your career. What brought you back to California then? Job with Bert Rowan. He was in Palo Alto. And then have you been on the West Coast ever since? I've been, yeah, I've been here since then. Yeah. Yeah. I noticed you didn't make Buffalo your permanent home. <laughs> I moved to Texas from Buffalo. I could, the cold was so bad. I just couldn't stand it. <laughs> <laughs> but it gets cold in New Zealand, doesn't it? No, it's not California. Is it? Like Northern California. Yeah, of course, you're in Northern California now. And so does it snow in New Zealand? It does in the South Island and then on the mountains in the North Island, but not where I grew up. I grew up in Auckland. So Auckland is 70 degrees most of the time. Wow. We might get 70% humidity. <laughs> oh, it sounds wonderful. We've been talking to a lot of people in Auckland because some leads regarding the Colonial Parkway murders are steering us to a person of interest from Auckland. I've never been, but I've, um, I talked to people as recently as last evening 
we're always trying to work around the time difference, which is significant. I'm trying to figure out, was it, is it noon there or is it midnight? We'll see where this all goes. But I've been talking to people who are very charming. Like, Bill, you, do you now have some DNA then from your sister's case? We have DNA. I always have to answer this in such a nuanced way. I'm not an attorney, but sometimes I feel like I talk like one. <laughs> we have potential perpetrator DNA in three of the four crime scenes in the Colonial Parkway murders. However, according to the FBI, and getting a straight answer out of the FBI can be difficult, and I know you've got good friends there, as do I, they are much more comfortable asking questions rather than answering questions. So according to law enforcement, there's no linkage between the four crime scenes in the four double homicides in the Colonial Parkway murders so there's no forensic link. There is potential offender DNA in three of the four crime scenes, but none of it matches. And so far, in terms of what they've told us, we don't have a match for any of these potential DNA samples. So I feel like that was a very long-winded answer with a lot of asterisks, but there is potential offender DNA. So you're going to have to do investigative gene genetic genealogy then? If I can convince the Federal Bureau of Investigation to do it. There's been a lot of push and pull behind the scenes with the Bureau in this case. There have been a lot of problems. The people that we're dealing with now obviously weren't the people that were handling this case 35 years ago, but we've had a lot of problems and a, a lot of missed opportunities over the years. With So did you ever resolve with the, the, the hair that was in was it your sister's hand? It was dog hair or human hair? That's a podcast in and of itself. <laughs> yes, the, it is. <laughs> the latest word that we have is that it is human hair, but I don't know that we've identified anyone. It's a struggle. It really is. Trying to continue to push for resources to be put into what is now a 35-year-old cold case with missed opportunities and discarded evidence and just a lot of problems. I introduced our FBI agents to Ed Green in the hopes of getting a dialogue started about advanced testing of hair, but I have not heard anything regarding any identification, any extraction of a usable DNA profile from the hair in my sister's hand. Because we've now solved several cases with hair. Oh, I definitely see the opportunity, as, yeah. and I know you yeah, have. And Ed Green is the one, of course, who, who did those. Yeah. He was wonderful. And uh, he said, Bill, just like everybody else, when they hear the story, they all have the same reaction, which is they all respond as human beings and as scientists. And Ed said the same thing that other people have said. This is an amazing case. Bill, I'll do anything I can to help you. But it's convincing the Bureau to step outside their comfort zone and work with people that might be a little bit outside the usual labs and the usual people that they work with, and how compartmentalized the Bureau can run into a lot of those kind of issues. I worked on a case with Steve Kramer and the FBI, that case out of Idaho, where all, the only evidence we had was two hairs from her body, and we were actually, Ed was able to get enough DNA out of, there was one of the hairs was a male pubic hair, he got an, enough DNA out of that for us to identify the, the perpetrator. That's so that amazing. Wow. Steve Kramer is another person who was very helpful and very open to what I had to say. I reached out to him several years ago after you had broken the Golden State Killer case. He's not directly involved in the Colonial Parkway murders. And there's a lot of silos if you, within the Bureau. I think Steve's star has risen within the Bureau, and I think he has a lot more to say about how we use investigative genetic genealogy on FBI mm -hmm. cases than he did, what was that now? Is that four years ago? Can that really be? It's unbelievable, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, Barbara, I wanted to ask you a question. When you and I first met, which is three and a half years ago now, you were very publicity averse. I still am. <laughs> 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 Tell us about that. I'm just personally rather shy. And yeah, I feel, un I guess I feel uncomfortable just talking to folks. So I give very few interviews. I'm doing this because I know you. We've chatted at length down at the beach club, and I'm fascinated by your sister's story. And I would love to help if I could too. So if ever you get anybody to get you some DNA, I would be pleased to help with it. Oh, thank you. This is, this means a lot. 
I would love that. We're still working on it. I think the people that are handling the case now are a lot more open to new mm-hmm. ideas than some of their prede- predecessors. All I'm trying to do is keep the case moving forward. I'm now of the opinion, and Kristen, feel free to disagree with me, that these four double homicides in the Colonial Parkway murders, the more I learn, the less I think they're related. And I agree. It sounds like, yeah, maybe a copycat. Yeah, certainly you can make a case that these offenders might have mixed up their MOs a bit, and that may be deliberate. But I actually think that some, if not all, of the Colonial Parkway murders are unrelated. And we'll see. Barbara, tell us a little bit, if you're comfortable, about establishing your new company, which is Firebird Forensics Incorporated. What we decided we needed to do is that there's been some grant money floating around that's been given out mainly to fairly large law enforcement group, the smaller police departments who obviously also have cold cases that could benefit from IgG, really don't have the wherewithal to use the technique. And it's such a powerful technique that basically most cases can probably ultimately be solved if you've got DNA evidence. We saw Othram with their DNA solves doing some fundraising so that they could pay for some of the stuff. And we thought, and of course, DNA Dog Project does that also. So what we thought was if we can establish ourselves as a not-for-profit organization, we can get people to donate to Firebird Forensics. They can specify a case or they can just help pay for some of the testing and also help pay for some of our stuff. We do cap our fees for law enforcement. So we never charge anything more than $4,000 for a regular law enforcement case. If it's a NICMIC case, National Center for the for Missing and Exploited Children, we cap our fees for them at $1,000. It's not a lot because a lot of these cases may take a great deal more time than is covered by $4,000. But we've got a really great group of people who aren't looking to make a whole lot of money. It's nice to get some because it's actually fairly expensive maintaining all the, the search engines and so on that we have to use to try and work on stuff. The main thought behind it is just this way we'd, we would be able then to offer some kind of support to some of the law enforcement agencies that could not otherwise afford to do this. Why the image of the firebird? I love it. I'm just curious uh, why you chose it. There's actually a couple of reasons. The main reason actually is one of the cases that we worked on, gosh, it must be now two, three years ago, maybe three years ago, was the Clearfield Rapist. Oh, and yes. We were, we were fascinated by the fact that he drove a Pontiac Firebird. Oh, I was going to say this has nothing to do with the car. <laughs> <laughs> it just seemed to... to to us, most of us are female, and we just thought there was that such a it's this iconic muscle car. Surely they could find <laughs> a fire no a Pontiac Firebird. It apparently was black and had sheepskin seat covers. But I talked to Pete Headley about that and he said actually it's very difficult to trace cars, particularly across state lines. But in any event, it seemed to us that was just too much for this guy to be able to drive around in his Pontiac Firebird. The other reason also is, of course, the image of the firebird. You've got rising from the ashes, you've got rebirth. So there's lots of imagery around the term firebird. But the initial impetus was actually that this car. (laughs) I can't believe this because I'm a big car guy. I was reading in preparation for this interview, very excited to have you, Barbara. I was reading about Firebird Forensic Group, and of course, I'm looking at your website, and I thought to myself, of course, this has nothing to do with the car. This must have to do more with the Firebird and the Phoenix rising, the ashes, the sort of the uplift and inspirational aspect of a bird and a bird in flight and those kind of images thought to myself, Bill, don't mention the car because it's definitely (laughs) not going to be the car. (laughs) And it really does have something to do with the car. (laughs) That is a nonprofit. Is that correct? Yes. We just applied for -for not-for-profit status with the IRS. I this is about 10 months ago. We just found out this week that we're, our application is finally being reviewed. So we're hoping we should imminently have approval from the IRS. That's very exciting. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. $4,000 cap, that can't even come close to covering the number of hours that are required to do investigative genetic genealogy. How does that work? It does if we get really close matches, but no, for most of them, it's writing off probably 75% of our time. 
but that's okay. As I said, we don't, we're none of us, when we interview people to join the group, and we're very explicit that you're not going to make a lot of money doing this. You'll get some money, but you won't get a lot just because we do cap our fees. And a lot of these cases are extremely difficult. We're working on a set of cases right now for Cuyahoga County in Ohio. These are sexual assault kits from their backlog. So these are cold cases. Some of them are 10, 20, 30 years old. And most of them, the perpetrator is not white. Anytime you're working on cases where the person you're trying to identify is not white, it's very difficult because there are not as many folks in the database who are not white. 80% of the people who have done DNA testing are white. When I say white, people who've got basically Northern and Western European ancestry. Oh, so wow. those cases are much easier to solve because there's just so many more people. As an example, most people who are of Northern or Western European ancestry, when they test at, say, Family Tree DNA or they upload to JetMatch, they're going to have probably at least one to 2,000 matches. If they're Jewish, they're going to have a lot more. They're going to have maybe 20,000 matches. If you've got somebody who's, who is Black or Hispanic, you're probably down to two or 300 matches. And since you're playing the odds, basically, what are the odds of you getting a second cousin match? If you've got okay. 3,000 matches, you've got a fairly decent chance of maybe getting a third cousin, and periodically you'll get something better than that. When you've only got two or 300 matches, it's less likely. And it's also less likely that you're going to get people who are matching at a close enough level that you can connect them which is what's really important when we're doing this stuff, because we're trying to connect people's trees to find common ancestors. And so the numbers are important. Do you think that will change over time, Barbara? Do you think more African-American and Latino folks will participate in genealogy? I don't know. We've been trying to do some education and that, as an example, these cases that we're talking about from Cuyahoga, the victims are also Black. When we don't have a lot of matches, we don't have very big matches, what we do is we do what we call reference samples. So we'll identify people that we think are possibly closer relatives than the matches that we have. Or sometimes we're even, because we've got such, I guess the right word is pitiful matches, we're even trying to figure out which side of the matches tree we're even going to look at. We'll contact people to ask them if they will test or if they've already tested, if, they've, if they'll upload to the Jed Match or Family Tree DNA. When we're working on cases where we've got a white perpetrator or a white unknown remains, almost 100% of people will agree to help. With the non-white, we're lucky if we get 50%. Is that a trust issue or a suspicion of government, authority, that kind of thing? I'm not real clear what the reason is, and but some of them are really rude. They'll be literally swearing at whoever's trying to call for the Cuyahoga cases. That it's actually the prosecutor's office that's making the phone calls. For other cases, it's usually the detective. And yeah, people are just, they're very anti-law enforcement and probably with good reason. And that's you have to it. consider the history and the mm -hmm. fact that law enforcement and the minority community in the U.S. do not have a great relationship. My friends in law enforcement get offended when I say that, but I don't think there's any way around it. Well, there's, the headlines we've had over the last year or so. Yeah. Exactly. There's you know, a lot good. of inherent suspicion on both sides, whether it's law enforcement or whether it's minority communities. And unfortunately, there was a case recently where any of the detectives that I work with, I always tell them, and I know Steve Kramer does this also, is that when you're calling somebody to ask them to be a reference sample, is you tell them the truth. You tell them, I'm looking for somebody who was probably your second cousin based on other match information that I have. And so I need your DNA to help me either verify that or refute that. There was a case, I think it was out of Atlanta, but I'm not 100% sure, where the detectives did not do that. The person that they were trying to get a consensual sample from was the mother of the person they were trying to identify. And then they, of course, once they got her DNA, they then arrested her son. Wow. So they had not told Ooh. her the person we're trying to rule out is your son, which they should have done. That kind of stuff doesn't help. No, it certainly it doesn't. Boy, you, there's so much delicacy here. You've got to be honest with people. You really do. And you no, know, usually what we're trying to do is actually do a, better, do a second cousin. There's a couple of reasons for that. One is there you're less likely to be by mistake testing the person who's the perpetrator. <laughs> Secondly, 100% of second cousins should have matching DNA. And so it gives us a way to, to self-authenticate. So if somebody isn't who they think they are, 
that maybe there's been an affair in the family or somebody was adopted and they didn't know or somebody has changed their name and they don't match with our crime scene DNA. And it turns out they also don't match with their other cousins that we have. Then we know that they're not who they think they are. And so we can disregard their results. It gives us a couple of safety levels. One being that we're less likely to be actually calling the perpetrator or somebody that he's likely to know or that they're just somebody whose ancestry is not what they think it is. I was wondering if it helped if the detectives or the people from the prosecutor's office who are reaching out, they try to make it clear that we are talking about minority victims as well. We're talking about within the African-American community. We're talking about black on black crime here, and we're trying to solve these terrible rapes that took place. One of the ones that we're working on, the guy is responsible for five different rapes, very brutal rapes, all on black women. We haven't been able to get anybody to be a reference sample. Do you think that any of the reticence on the part of some people to want to be tested has anything to do with those privacy concerns that kept popping up within the first couple of years of discussing investigative genetic genealogy? I don't think that's really a privacy issue. I think Bill was right. I think it's distrust. And unfortunately, there is reason for distrust. It also can be in some of these where we've had somebody who has really vehemently been opposed to helping. When we've looked at some of their other relatives, we've found that maybe they've got a brother or a sister who's incarcerated. Yeah, they're probably not going to want to be helpful. (laughs) While we're talking about these trust issues, and Kristen is touching on this as well, I think, do you feel like the conflicts within the genealogy community that we've seen over the last few years, do you feel like any of that has settled down? There were people that were railing against investigative genetic genealogy, and they saw it as a misuse of these genealogical databases. What's your thinking about that now that we're a couple of years into this? Of course, I still disagree with them. They're still out there. They're still, unfortunately, they tend to be very vocal. I guess the problem that I have is those very same people that are so vocal against using IgG for identifying suspects in violent crimes or unidentified human remains they're also the same people who are out there doing unknown parentage searches. And to me, that's hypocritical to say it's an invasion of privacy to identify a suspect in a, viol- in a violent crime, but it's not a violation of anybody's privacy to help people find their birth relatives, when quite often that can be very destructive to oh, a family. We lived this yeah. in, in my family a couple of years ago. <laughs> yep. and we won't get into all the details here, but... It created a lot of very hard feelings in my family. Same happened in my family here, actually, a little more recently. Mm -hmm. Same thing. It is very, it upends a lot of things. Exactly. And why one is okay and the other is not, I really don't understand. Particularly, you've also got people who are donor conceived. And of course, the donors were guaranteed anonymity. They were back in the day. Yes. And now you've got kinds of got 33 kids knocking on their door saying, hi, daddy. To me, it is hypocritical to say it's okay to do one. It's not okay to do the other. I took a fair amount of heat on some of those forums a couple of years ago because I'm upfront about who I am and why investigative genetic genealogy is of interest to me. I think there's a possibility that it could help solve some or all the Colonial Parkway murders. And I was attacked, and I mean attacked, by people that make money assisting people who are searching for answers, which they have a right to do. I am fully supportive of folks who have come through the adoption system and are now looking for their birth parents or looking for lost relatives. There's so many positive outcomes here. Your point is a really good one, Barbara, which is that those new pieces of information, which are often developed by the search angels and people who are paid consultants, can be just as disruptive as finding out who killed your kid's sister. Mm -hmm. Some of these people acted like we were somehow using these available databases in an immoral way. There was also a very strong sense of ownership of these databases, which these people had not created. They just used them Mm -hmm. for good. I'm not implying that trying to help someone find their long lost relatives isn't a worthwhile cause. Of course it is. But this sort of arrogance and smugness and aggressive behavior towards people like me that are also looking for answers and think that, look, you've got millions of data points here, which might help solve unsolved murders and unidentified remains and so many other benefits. 
Why are you trying to build a fence around this? I absolutely agree. I have been called unethical. I've been called all kinds of names. And so I've faced the same kind of abuse that you're talking about. How anybody can decide that what I'm doing is unethical to take somebody like the GSK off the street, I don't know, but they do. So you're going to talk about this in your new book? I don't talk about it a lot. I've got some stuff about what I think about the ethics, the arguments that are made about Fourth Amendment rights and a few other things, which I really don't agree with. I think the people who are trying to use those arguments don't necessarily understand how the law actually works for you know, particularly Fourth Amendment rights. The whole privacy thing, that, so that really took me aback. I really could not understand where people were coming from, particularly since I know that the most vocal were people who do unknown parentage searches. And I'm with you, Bill. Absolutely, people are entitled to know who they are. As Kristen mentioned, she and I have both had situations in our family in the last yeah. couple of years where unknown parented situations came forward, and we both lived it. Kristen, yours was pretty recent. It was within the last two years. It just, it upends so many things, not just for the person who's found out this information, but for anybody who's involved in the structure of your family. Like you think everything there is to know about your family. And then all of a sudden you get blindsided with, wow, <laughs> maybe this isn't as stable as I thought it was. Maybe the world isn't what I thought it was. It's weird. Yeah. I think there is a good quote from Blaine Bettinger, which I really like and I agree with, which is that you're entitled to know who you are, but you're not entitled to a relationship with your genetic relatives. Yeah. I think that's probably both of you were running a foul of stuff is whoever it was decided they should be invited to Thanksgiving dinner, which is unfortunate. And I've seen it happen with some of the people that I've helped find their birth relatives where suddenly they seem to think that they're entitled to this familial relationship, which is just not correct. There's some heavy issues in all of this. Is it possible for you to name a case that you're proudest of working on of all of the cases that you've worked on so far? It would have to be GSK. So the Golden State Killer case. I don't like using his name, so I just call him GSK. Uh -huh. I don't mind avoiding his actual formal name. What is it about GSK that makes you feel the way you do? It was a very difficult case. The initial matches that we had were very small. We did luck out and get some larger matches along the way. And we also did a consensual sample, which basically helped us solve the case. So we did eventually have some good fortune. But as Paul will say, he, he did a count on the number of trees because this was the first time that any of them were working on doing anything like this. It was really like herding cats. They were busy <laughs> setting up new trees and building trees. And uh, trying to rein them in was, I think I sent an email to Steve Kramer at one point, and I said that working with them was like working with somebody trying to pin the tail on the donkey when they didn't know which end of the donkey they had. <laughs> <laughs> and the rest of the people weren't really familiar with genetic genealogy, were they? No. So I'm teaching them how to do it. Uh -huh. And they were a quick study. And smart people, without Absolutely. question. So, yeah, they thought they, that they knew more than they did earlier on. So they didn't know the nuances of picking which people you wanted to build a tree on. So it took a little bit of reining in to do that. I think we ended up with something like 25 trees. We actually now only build one tree, and we include in it our, our most significant matches. So we've evolved in, in how we do stuff. Back then, we had all these trees, and we're trying to figure out ways to connect them. And they would forget that they needed to be staying within the biological thing, and they would have managed to stray off into a, an in-law. <laughs> and then they'd find a criminal record for the in-law, and I'm saying, mm, no, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, you're going down the wrong road there. What was it like for you when you realized, we got the match, we've got him, we've got GSK? That must have been an incredible moment. I actually wasn't in on that part of it. I gave them the name that I thought was the correct one. Then I quite literally did not hear anything for about 10 days because I'm not law enforcement. But then I got a phone call from Steve and Paul Holes letting me know that he'd been arrested the day before. Wow. I had also said when we started working on it that I wanted to remain anonymous. Yes. I said, I'm also making sure that I still wanted to remain anonymous. And I said, absolutely. I'm the only one right now doing this. I don't want some knucklehead out there who has left his DNA where he shouldn't, deciding that I can identify him and that I should be done away with. So I remained anonymous for a while. That day you and I sat down, which is three and a half years ago now, 
we had two iced teas and you walked me through a bit about how you done what you done. I remember being so surprised by this expressed desire, the thing you just said about, look, I don't want to be identified as the person that puts serial killers away. You said something to me to the effect of we've proven that the concept works, but I don't want somebody who now realizes that this potentially very powerful tool could be used to identify him as a serial killer. I don't want to be that person where they all of a sudden they're start talking about this amazing lawyer slash scientist slash genealogist, Barbara Ray Venter. And you have a distinctive name too. It's not like your name is Jane Smith. I remember you were very adamant about not wanting to discuss where you live or have your name out there or whatever. What changed your mind though? Actually, Pete Headley's the one who changed my mind. Once other people were out there doing this, so Colleen Fitzpatrick was out there, Cece was out there, and they're both much more flamboyant than I am. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Pete just felt that it was okay for me to now come out of the closet, as it were. So he actually contacted Paul and said, you need to do a tweet and say it was Barbara who solved the case. Paul did that once he had your okay. Because I remember him outing you, if you will, for this amazing work that you did. But I figured you had to be on board by that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, Pete had called me and he said, you need to come out of the closet and let me come <laughs> call and have him do a tweet. <laughs> so we figured that, yeah, I was would not be the focus because I'm shy and behind the, the scenes here. So even now, this isn't something that you love doing. Here you are being named by Time Magazine as one of the most influential people. Does that feel strange? It does. I did go to that. It was fun. So I took my son with me and yeah. <laughs> What I'm learning is that actually, if we're going to make fiber forensics work and be able to raise money, then obviously I'm going to have to do a little more speaking in public, as it were, and giving interviews than I have been. Oh, and I think you'll find, Barbara, that people are going to be so interested in what you have to say and that they're going to be excited to meet you. People are pulling for your success. Somebody has to be a pioneer. Somebody has to be the Amelia Earhart of, <laughs> of IgG. <laughs> Actually, a person who came up with the idea was Lisa Jensen. She asked Pete Headley, she'd been watching, I don't know, Who Do You Think You Are? or one of those shows. And she called him and said, could I find out who I am by doing DNA? And so, of course, he then contacted DNA Adoption and got a hold of me. Really, it started with Lisa Jensen Headley. And Lisa trying to solve the mystery of her own right. heritage. Yeah, Can you imagine being 30 years old and having absolutely no idea who you are? No, that would be wow. pretty amazing. Mm -mm. On top of that, the guy that she thought was her father, she didn't find out he was not her father until he was arrested when she was like 20 years old. And he's somebody who had molested her. He had tortured her, just horrendous stuff. She had thought that man was her father. And it wasn't until he got arrested and the sheriff in Contra Costa County decided it doesn't make any sense that this turkey is her father. And she ran the DNA and discovered that, no, he wasn't. Are there any cases that you're working on right at the moment that you can share, or does that all need to fly under the radar for a little bit now? There are a couple that we've just done where the perpetrator is actually deceased. So there's one that we've actually worked on for a very long time it was the Nicole Smith case out of Atlanta. Yeah, Mac was just talking about that one. Yeah, that was another very difficult case. Again, you've got a black perpetrator, and in this case, also a black victim. We didn't have very big matches. I think our matches, the biggest one was like 73 centimorgans or something. So we actually just connected two trees. The other one was 48 centimorgans. And so we were actually able to connect them. The two trees connected through a marriage. And when you have that happen, then the person you're looking for is a descendant from that marriage. There was actually a very good sketch of the perpetrator for this one. I was surprised yeah. how much the perpetrator ended up looking like the sketch. It was really quite yeah. something that people had to have known it was him because the minute that we, so there were two brothers who were descended from this marriage he had of course just died i think in november we identified him in i think it was late november early december so we found all these pictures of him for the memorial for his funeral and we took one look at the picture and knew it was him not his brother when wow. cheryl mccollum and her team presented about this case when it was not yet yeah. solved but they were working on it when they showed the sketch versus the photograph was unbelievable. There was a yeah. gasp in the audience. He looked so much like the sketch. Mm. And I'm with you. I have a hard time believing that some people hadn't seen that sketch and said, I know who that is. And he lived not far from where Nicole had lived. So the fact that nobody had come forward is really disturbing. 
I'm thrilled that you worked on that one. I know Mac and her team have really been working with that one for quite a while. So I was so glad to hear that, that they had cracked it. That's wonderful. We cannot thank you enough, Barbara, for your leadership and also for taking the time to talk to us today. Oh, you're very welcome. It was a pleasure. And we are so looking forward to seeing you at Crime Time. <laughs> yeah, I need to send in my little things. This is what I did before Austin. I forgot to send in the, my contract thing. So I need to get that to my attorney and get that in. Send, you, send in your paperwork. I will do yes. that. That's going to wrap it up for this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs> <laughs>